All right, we're going to call the meeting to yes. order. See if you can't get this thing rolling. First up is public comment. Anything not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll uh, approve the agenda. Any motion? Before you do, we have something to add to executive session that came out of something we did yesterday. So it would be to add a what do we call it? pending probable litigation item. So it's one DSA 313A1E. And before you go into executive session later, you'll need the two motions. So it'll be the motion finding it's necessary. Motion to enter. I will second. Um, I will second that motion from staff to approve the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 First up is uh, first Friday public assembly permit. Got some additional information today on this. Yes. So I'm Peter Reed, the board president of RECBC. Um, yeah, I sent out a, a brief document, but basically we're trying to address some of the concerns that had come up before. Um, and I guess to summarize them, first the volume of the music, we're going to address that with the bands and maybe with the type of bands we, we select. So we will make sure that that doesn't get over the top and people can actually carry on a conversation in the, in the street there. Um, we have hired a, uh, one security person to, for this first event to basically patrol and we'll orient them on areas that we want them just to keep an eye on. Um, back street and, and hopefully keeping an eye kind of in the restaurant area to make sure that we don't have any liquor infractions going on. Uh, we're also uh, contracting for a, a porta potty um, and we're working on where that goes, but I think I've got a spot uh, right through the little corridor going to back street there on the other side. Um, and we'll also put some additional signs up to try to alleviate the parking concerns uh, direct people to the municipal, municipal lots. Um, I'm not sure that's going to be 100% effective, but at least we'll, we'll try to, to do that. Um, in terms of the resident parking, there's really not much we can do, um, but uh, we will try to be nice to them and, and hopefully they will cooperate. So that's, that's basically what we've done to this point. We have hired a downtown program manager. Um, Stephanie was kind enough to introduce her around to a few people in town, so uh, I hope that will add to our resource to be able to manage these uh, a little better. Um, not that there was anything wrong with them last year. <laughs> it's all good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a work in progress. Yeah, that's right. Are. And, and certainly as we go along uh, after the first event, we were glad to take feedback from, from anybody on how it went. If there's issues that come up, we're glad to address them as we go forward. But that's basically where we're at uh, together with the information we provided at the last meeting. Any questions? Concerns? Okay. Thank you. Nobody has questions. Okay. Entertain a motion. A motion to approve the permit application, assembly of the public assembly permit application for First Friday. And I will second that, um, subject to the conditions that Mr. Reed has, you know, expressed in terms of what they're going to do. Addendum. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Three See you there. The <laughs> mm -hmm. How many do we have on the recreation committee now? There are, yeah. Five out of the eight slots, is it? I think so. There's three opens. It's on, it's on the website. Right? Uh, All right. So we have room for both of these. Anybody have any concerns with either of the parties wanting to be on the right committee? I think as long as they are willing to be supportive and helpful, it would be great. I'd like to, to move the. Um, 
appointment of both uh, both parties to the rec committee. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Grant applications. So there are two in this round right here. They're both for our fledgling police department. Um, the bigger one is a, it's under one Governor's Highway Safety Program umbrella, but there are different pieces to that. So there's distracted driving, some DUI enforcement, some speed enforcement, um, distracted driving education, and then we do get access to essentially reimbursement for a drug recognition expert as part of this whole package. Unlike the other grant ones where you have dedicated patrols or activities, that'll be one that we get reimbursed for as we use it. And so JM, who's the second cop of our two cop force, is a certified DRE, so it would be sort of using those services. So it pays for all of the employee costs we put in for a grant amount. He's done a few of these before. Historically, you shoot high and end up somewhere around halfway from what the ask is. There are no matches for anything except for the education pieces, in which case the match comes in in the kind of contribution. So meaning our officers would go out and do whatever the education activities would be. Otherwise, the state reimburses us for those relevant patrols. We keep track of those separately. Um, so total ask is closer to about, I think it was $50,000, 50 to 60, when you total up all the different potential salary pieces if we got a full ask. Um, I'm probably going to end up somewhere in the 20 to 30 range. The grant's not live until October 1st. And, uh, but we had to submit the applications. Take a little bit of a gamble. We've done this before, but usually we'll ask for permission before we apply for the grant. Um, sometimes the grant deadlines fall in between the windows. This one did that. So it's one of those retroactive requests for approval. If you say no, then we'll pull the application um, tomorrow. But so there's that one, that's through the state. The other one is through our insurer, BLCT Passive. They do safety and equipment grants. Um, so that's a little less than $6,000 there. Most of that's for taser cameras. We're gonna buy them anyway. This just sort of replaces what we were gonna use on the startup money for. And there's gloves, lighted safety vests. And then when it says batons, it's not the swinging at somebody type. It's more the, if there's an accident, we need to light them up at, at night. Traffic so control. Right. Um, so those are the primary items. You could swing them at each other. <laughs> lightsabers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can do a lightsaber battle. <laughs> <laughs> each other. Yeah. Well, exactly. on that path, oh, yeah. the board meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Darth Vader. As long as we get to like test them first, make sure they're okay. I think we're... Uh, that's a similar one with the deadline, more or less passed. Those also don't have a match. Nice. I like those. to approve applying. Uh, I'll move the application for, for the grants. Second. Yeah. Erica, get oh, the in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, this next one is a request for speed and traffic enforcement. And I've read this, Trevor, and I'm concerned that it's not ready to come to the board. I think it needs to be looked at by Scott and possibly John, um, see what that looks like because we're not going to have the whole picture. Like, I want to know from the highway side what some of these things mean for their maintenance and their activities, but also from the law enforcement side. Will they work? What does that mean? What is, how does that even Don't function? those have to be approved by the State Department of Transportation? Yes. Yeah. So there's a whole process. Yeah, there's, you have to and it's there. not, we can't even consider it at this level at this point because we don't know, we don't even, we don't have any of the stuff we need to look at it. What is the process for applying for those? Does it come through the local law enforcement agency? Or is it? Well, I think the law enforcement looks at it from what they can, what can and can't be done there, mm -hmm. what works. Uh, highway needs to look at it from, you know, some of these things are going to be maintenance nightmares mm -hmm. on their side, and then look to be trans to what's allowed on on the state highway. It might be so a mix of application and location too. So mm -hmm. where you're talking to about, so with the just to pick the movable speed bump. So when we did the paving on School Street, we took out the permanent ones. They were a maintenance headache. They were difficult to figure in the winter, but the idea was that those are going to come out and at some point here late spring, early summer, we're going to see some of the movable ones go in. 
So they replace like for like in those locations and provide that speed control on that kind of side or accessory street mm -hmm. where they found mm -hmm. before. Um, so that's an application that's within our control, but if you wanted to put those videos to do something different or like that on, a, on the section of 66, say beyond the Central Street Bridge, right where you get to the golf course, that's all the entrances. Maybe the, the arbiter of what's okay and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And then in the class one town highways, we probably at least want to make sure that they're okay with whatever we do. And so they're, I mean, they're mostly our responsibility, but they're technically serious. But each of you has a little more research and whatnot that needs to be done before we're ready to to even have a conversation about them. So, so do you want us to take that one back? Maybe we'll connect with Amanda just to make sure that we talk through what she's got in here, understood and some of the ideas, and then... I think so, because I don't think it's ready for prime time at all. I think it's... Uh, and the state has certain things they allow, certain things they don't allow. There's a traffic committee at the state level that has a say on all this, the same as they do speed limits. Um, there's quite a process to, to doing any of these types of things, especially right there. But I think it needs to go to, to those folks and not before this board. Yeah. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Um, I do have some additional information for you all to consider, and that might help you when you uh, go to these other entities. Um, honestly, uh, at minimum, there is probably $410,000 that you can be gaining in revenue by purchasing and deploying one speed camera probably at the Central Street um, location. That's for Larry, who's not here. Um, if you were to do this, that money could be used to not only pay for the system, but also part of the police force, uh, which we all recognize is going to need a huge bump. And that would alleviate raising taxes to the point that is going to be necessary. So I hope that you will consider this. As far as on the back side are the costs uh, associated with one camera, probably about 44,000 for are you one. looking at issuing speeding tickets by cameras? Yes, ma'am. You can't do that in Vermont. It's uh, not allowed by the law. Well, they issue red light tickets. So why speeding. not speeding tickets? The law doesn't allow it. Does the, not, does the law not allow it, or has it just not been done? It doesn't allow it. We've been through this state, many, state many times. State law does not allow it. Well. Talk um, to Larry. <laughs> What's that? Larry <laughs> might be your first stop. <clears throat> um, well, perhaps. We can't even enforce violations in a construction zone based on cameras, so. Okay, well. Uh, eight cameras. If you reviewed the information that I had sent previously, um, if you clicked on the link that talks about the three towns that issue 25% of all of the tickets throughout Vermont, Sunderland. Um, again, uh, now that's a non-automated that's a non-automated way to issue tickets. Um, certainly not generating the amount of income by an automated system that would catch every single person 24-7. Um, so there's money to be made to pay for some of the things that we already know that we need. Um, so I ask for reconsideration at another time. Perhaps the law could be changed. I mean, I really don't. I don't understand why it's legal everywhere else and not here in Vermont. Um, somehow those people figured out. Because it's Vermont. <laughs> it's Vermont. Yeah. You figured out all the things we do here that nobody else does. <laughs> so there are certainly other things that you can look to do. The rumble strips, uh, that's, that's inexpensive, can be done by your own personnel. You don't not even. Not on the state highway. Uh, have you, uh, you, so yeah. right now, rumble strips get a lot of complaints from the people who live near them. 
they're loud inside people's homes. Do you understand so how loud what? speeding traffic is? I'm telling you, we have gone back and filled them in. The, because of the noise that people have. The noise homes. between it's, 45 miles an hour down to 25 miles an hour, which is the speed limit on Central Street, is significant. There have been speed studies and noise studies. So mm -hmm. I, I understand that not everyone will like it, but it will solve a lot of problems. It will slow people down. Police are a deterrent, so are rumble strips, so are speed bumps, so are speed humps along with additional signage, et cetera. So it's not only for you know, the people that live along those streets, but it's for the pedestrians and everyone else that lives and uh, I guess enjoys this town. It seems like, it seems like this issue um, has not been addressed um, properly in the past, uh, despite many uh, many attempts to make it known. So that's why I decided to bring it to the select board ahead of time, hoping that we could get somewhere. Um, so if there's something else that the select board would like me to do to research, if they don't have time to do it, I'll be happy to do so. Okay. I think it's safe to say we can toss it back to Trevor and John and yeah. Scott. And, and, and I, I do think that the earlier suggestion that you talk to our state reps, um, Jay and, and Larry, Jay Hooper and Larry Sackowitz, because our hands are tied to a large degree at the municipal level by the state regs, particularly when it comes to state roads. Um, so. And then John, the traffic, or the John is part of the highway and roads crew, so he'll be able to tell you which roads on here are state and which there's discretion for, and then you can outline it from there. Um, and he's pretty amicable and easy to work with, generally. And the okay. highway safety grant will boost some of our, hopefully some of the enforcement capability, mm -hmm. and there are two pieces of equipment that hopefully will come with that as part of those grant applications that make it easier to perform speed enforcement. One is that all of the radar um, equipment in the vehicles right now is fixed. So if you have to have the cop car kind of pointed right at it when somebody mm -hmm. travels through that field of vision. Moving just to the handhelds will allow us to more effectively enforce somebody who might be speeding before they, they find the hiding spot. And then a uh, mobile speed cart that you've seen around, sort of the bigger signage ones that provide that sort of short-term knowledge deterrent. It's not a long-term fix in that case, but in short-term applications that can impact yeah. people's speeds as it really yeah. draws their attention to yeah. it. You know, the little one that's right there, so the bridge the helps me probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People have become yeah. accustomed to it. Yeah. I, I do find that the, the cameras with the digital readouts that tell you what your speed is, um, at least as far as my driving are concerned, <laughs> uh, are very effective because I, I drive from Randolph to Woodstock a good deal and um, go through Barnard. And there are, Barnard is another one of those notorious towns for nailing people for speeding, um, but they have going into Barnard from Bethel, and then exiting uh, or going into Barnard from Woodstock. There are cameras at each end. There are uh, the speed signs, the digital, I'm calling them digital speed signs at each end. And it, you know, when you see that you're doing 42 and suddenly it's 30, it, and it's similarly in Woodstock, going from Woodstock to Reading, past the, uh, past the Woodstock Elementary School, coming out of the village, it's 25 miles uh, an hour uh, up until uh, the Woodstock Country Club, and they have signs on both uh, digital speed signs on both ends, and it, it does it does slow you down. <clears throat> there's no question about it. But I also understand that those are expensive, and that there's a whole process you have to go through to be able to use them. So. Well, I can tell you they're not nearly as effective as one would hope on Central Street. It's just not. Well, and it doesn't, and it doesn't slow anyone coming down 
heading towards the interstate either. As soon as they go through that four-way stop, and especially past Mound Street, they are flying. Mm -hmm. And this has been an ongoing problem, I'm sure, long before I moved here, but certainly for the last four years that I have. Okay, so we have a plan for that one. Let's move on through the agenda. We have Orange County Parent Child Center's request for a bridge loan. Yep. You've got some information in your packets. Eric is here to present and to answer questions. We've been calling it a bridge loan is what we think is sort of the easiest way to describe the request. For so there was a request in for our book for this project, correct? Mm -hmm. How much is that for? Um, I don't believe an application has been submitted because I don't believe that that's gotten to that point in the process, but it was intended to be around 100000 I um, attended the last ARPA meeting, and they were going to come out of it and ask them for a dollar amount. Okay. Up to this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, they did, um, you know, they've scored all this stuff, and Orange County, this project was actually really, really high on their list. And so. So that process, to me, seems to be dragging. Um, I would have thought we would have had priorities and whatnot from them by now. I think they're planning coming to the next meeting. Yeah. Because they're definitely I mean, going to be themselves. I don't, I'm not sure why we would go with a loan versus just awarding them yeah. ARPA money and move it on. What's the difference between today and June 8th or 9th, say? Well, or is there one? Just. What's happened, because of um, the way that the state is administering the grant funds that came out of their community recovery and revitalization program, we have $3 million that's coming in at the end of this summer, but we need to be working from now through the summer to, that's when construction's supposed to start. And we are depending on the, the CRRP award to help us with that. Um, because the other funding is federal, they want to wait until we have a commitment from the federal funding and getting a commitment from HUD, despite the fact that it's a congressional earmark. <laughs> so it's in the budget that was passed in December, the money's coming to us. Um, we don't have a letter from HUD saying, this is the money you're getting and this is when you'll get it. Um, it's a process and we're in the middle of working through that process. USDA um, is going to be uh, guaranteeing the loan for the construction part of the project that's a price process. We're working through that process. We're hoping to get an obligation in June before um, or around before the next rate move. So what it comes down to is timing, is we need to be able to pay our bills from now until, I think what we said uh, is that we do have, fin we have funding that can get us through the end of May, but come June, it, it's problematic and we can't put a stop on it because if we put a stop on it we lose all of the contractors and everything that we have lined up for this summer and it's a child care project so they need to have they need to be in next July and we're already kind of up against that sort of deadline of having them in so that so that parents and schools their agreements for the pre-k support that they provide can all be finalized so it really is a, a timing issue and we're very gun shy now about funds that are coming <laughs> because we've been waiting for a couple of years for some of these funds. And so when um, it was actually trying to follow up on the status of the ARPA pending ARPA request to see if that might help us through the, the cash flow crunch period. Um, but it's, it just seems that a request now for kind of emergency cash flow support will be a more timely timely uh, processing of funding prior to an ARPA award is made, when an ARPA award is made. I think the select board has the ability to give the ARPA award. Pardon? I think the select board has the ability to give that ARPA award. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me to go through the process of spending admin time developing a loan agreement and terms and all that for hundred thousand dollars to keep them afloat if the ARPA award that's already being given a high priority in the process is for a hundred thousand dollar ARPA award from the panel that doesn't so um, if you have funding coming in uh, what was the funding from ARPA supposed to cover then 
Well, is it is it kind of extra money or is it? You know? There's no extra money. Sure. What we're trying to do <laughs> is we're trying to diminish the amount of um, loan of debt that we're carrying because yeah. what will happen is the 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 rental payments and lease payments from the child care center will go to service any debt that we're carrying. So the more we can decrease the amount of debt, then the more flexibility the child care center will, will have to actually pay their caregivers fair wages and provide more scholarship funds to students who are clients who are coming in. So um, right now, at the stage we're in right now, it'll go toward final construction draw design drawings and engineering. It's all of the stuff that we need to have in place uh, as construction manager that needs to happen so that we can actually break ground at the end of this summer. Does that answer your question? Yep. And what kind of scholarship, like what, what would the scholarships be for? It's just to diminish the, the, um, the rate that it would cost or fees for families that are low and moderate income. That's a normal subsidy that... Pardon? But outside of subsidy that those families could possibly get? Like for the families that are kind of in the middle ground there? Or? Yeah, and it would be through OCPCC. Right. Yeah, as opposed to through a, a state program. And that's actually part of, that's a mandate. A certain percentage of the seats and slots at this facility have to be available for low and moderate income families in order to qualify for the funding. So the request is for a hundred thousand dollar loan, which would take quite a bit of admin time, I think, because you had to do an agreement. You had to do all that. What would the process be to approve our funds? A vote. A motion, and we have to create essentially an invoice system to to pay on, which is much less of a uh, out of job. out of just respect for politeness. Um, to the ARPA committee that we've appointed, have they made a recommendation? Or Sounds like they're getting close. Yeah. What yeah. I, uh, are, are Matt Murawski is. Yeah, yeah. Well, I went to the meeting, and yeah. Matt Murawski is the chair now. And during that time, they were talking about this being one of the highest priorities. Yeah. I mean, we we don't have a um, how to put this a legal obligation to to respect their recommendations, but I think we do have sort of a collegial one. Uh, on the other hand, I would much rather see you get $100,000 of ARPA funding than taking on, as you just suggested, um, uh, a food debt. So, yeah, this is, well, the request is for us to give them a $100,000 loan. Right. So the only thing we're giving them a loan for is if the ARPA money's coming to them, right? Oh, we that's can't what give the them a loan out of the general fund. Yeah, yeah, right. right. We have no other fund to give them the money from. Well, we could just right. bypass the loan process and right. allocate the ARPA funding. Well, and right. if we're giving them a loan, we're saying we're going to give them the ARPA money. We're just waiting for the committee to catch up, which to me is a whole bunch of administrative paperwork for no reason. Mm -hmm. Right? Because we're saying we're going to give them the money if we're giving them a loan towards the money. Might as well just give them the money. Can we press the committee for a decision, given the timing here? We could try. Well, it sounds like it's one of their top priorities. Yeah. Some of them aren't going to make it up on the list. I can, I can, list I, I, there, some of the ones I've seen, I can appreciate. <laughs> <clears throat> I think it works. Specifying anything particular. <laughs> <laughs> what, Trevor, what's the turn time for drawing up an ARPA fund distribution, not low? We'd probably essentially run it through an AP process, is how we've envisioned it, at least in rough measures. The only ARPA funds we've deployed from the big award to date are for police department stand up. And essentially, what we did is move them into a capital reserve. And we've spent out of those. So there wasn't any money going out of the house directly. It's been as we've purchased stuff and we've paid for it. So we've run it a little bit like that system and that there'd be some kind of invoice that would appear in an accounts payable document that you approve and the treasurer signs the check after that. And then we've got some listing for that. We might create an account code that's specifically for ARPA awards. So like three business days to... <coughs> I think within a week and a half to two weeks would be 
be safe, um, depending on where we are in the cycle and what else has to go. I mean, Ms. Kaylin, she's pretty efficient, so we've been doing AP runs more often than we had in the preceding year, so it's certainly before Memorial Day, I, I, based on where we are now. Could you potentially draft that while we maybe get a vote or, or speak to the chair of the ARPA committee? and? Is that, a, is that an, a possibility you've been to the meetings? If so, that, or do they have to wait for a meeting? Um, they're going to do a, I mean, it's, I mean, they're advisory to you. So I guess it's, what are, what's the question we're asking them? We, this is what we're going to do in lieu of a loan. Do right. you have any objections? Or are we just sort of, this is a courtesy notice? I mean, sort of how are we framing right. that? Do you have any objections? What happens if they say no, no but you've already decided? And it's at the end of the day, you're where the buck stops. Right, right. Well, other than ruffling feathers, I mean. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So and and it, it sounds like their feathers are pretty well set on this anyway, right? So why not just grab the bull by the horns? And I agree with you. And make yeah. it happen. I think we're making it too complex. If it's yeah. already their top priority. I'd probably it's, say it is. We're I mean, going to provide notice that yeah. we yeah. intend to do this. And, I mean, if there's a clear path to getting something done, I'm just not an in-the-weeds person. You know? well, I think That's it's good. just a phone call to Matt to say, hey, understand this is your top priority. Give them a loan or give them their award. We're going to give them the award. You can right. remove that from your list and move your priorities up kind of thing. You know? Sure, That's, sure. Yeah. I like that. I also think, like, as a person who needed childcare, <laughs> I was really hoping to get my kids into this. It, like, it is so hard, and like that's like one I think one of the biggest challenges for families in our community is childcare, to the point where it's taking people out of the workforce, moving them away, like putting them in poverty. Like, it's so. It's huge, and other other communities are incentivizing the development of new childcare programs by uh, through their economic development committees and so on. It's a massive problem in this state, and I don't see a reason for a one or two month delay just out of you know politeness or yeah. protocol or whatever. Yeah. Especially if if they've already identified this as one of their priorities. I, mean, yeah. I think a, a nice polite notice to, to Matt that we we've, we've jumped the gun here. Yeah. This is different than the police one in that this has been in their water supply. For a very right. long time. Right. Whereas that one was in response to emergent right. conditions and it didn't make sense operationally. And I know that did community. ruffle some <coughs> feathers there, but I mean, yeah. um, once yeah. in a while you have to ruffle some feathers. All right. Well, I, I guess, do you just want a motion to approve, emergency approve $100,000 from ARPA funds? I don't think you asked me emergency, does it? As it's it's an emergency. <laughs> Urge your third emergency. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, you I will say. Red fonts on the. Red on fonts the and capital letters. Red and bold face. I, I will second the allocation of $100,000 in ARPA funding. Um, in lieu of a loan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. In lieu of a loan. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Only if it's in red. Thank Next you. up is the Randolph Center Fire Department a fire truck discussion. <coughs> That's you, Tim. You're just in time. <laughs> so, I'm Tim Angel, Randolph Center Fire Chief. So, our pumper truck is the oldest of all the fire trucks in town right now. It's a 1997. When it was originally purchased, I think the life of it was supposed to be 20 years. We refurb did some refurbishing of it, um, I, don't know, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, to bump that up to 25 years. So it's 26 years old. We've been talking to um, Dingy Machine in Cornish, New Hampshire, who made the fire truck originally. Right now, they're two years out on new trucks. But unlike a lot of the manufacturers, they will, if we decide to buy one, or the town decides to buy one, they will guarantee the price right now. A lot of manufacturers are saying, um, who knows what the price will be in two years. Well, if you want to order one, go ahead. So, you know, that 
We have a price of 400,000. The truck is basically gonna be same as we have now. We're gonna make a few adjustments to the um, control panel on it. Um, there are a couple other minor things, but basically it's gonna be the same truck. It's gonna have a plastic body instead of an aluminum body. The uh, last truck we got which is pretty near 10 years old, has a plastic body and it's working out great for us and that's, a lot of them are done that way now. Um, the truck we got 10 years ago was a dingy truck and we've had great luck with them. They're, as I said, they're in Cornish, New Hampshire, very good people to work with. We have a problem, we just take the truck down to Cornish, New Hampshire, which is only half hour, 45 minute drive, and it's, and sometimes they'll even send somebody right up to their fire station to work on them. I, you know, other than, other than that, I don't know. If you have questions about it, Larry did call me last week and said he had a couple fire departments wanting him to put a bid in on a truck. Their fire departments that he has never dealt with before and he would rather have our truck in the line than one of these other ones. But if we're not gonna say, yeah, go ahead and build one, then he's gonna bid on these other ones. One of the challenges we have, and Tim and I have talked about this before too, is that after buying the truck for the East Randolph Fire Department, when you look at the fire equipment reserve, which is where we've primarily tried to fund these from, after this year's transfers, we're about $109,000 in there. And we've got another 110 that's scheduled to arrive sometime after July 1. Mm -hmm. So as you start to think, how do you get to 400? We're only going to be sitting at 219, 220 as of June 30 of next year. And that's if we don't spend any other money out of it. And there's other equipment that we could theoretically from that reserve. And then if we look at the next year, even if we increase transfer slightly, which we were planning to do for this year, but as we balanced every other priority, they stayed the same. We put an extra, say, $5,000 and even $10,000 in. Now you're up to 335 to 345. So you're still trying to inch your way up to the $400,000 line. And then we'd essentially spend it all back out. So one of the challenges when you look at this truck and all the other trucks that are of that same end of useful life spectrum, we got four or five of them that are there or close. There's one that's close and four that are in it, I think, in terms of that best practices range. Um, Obviously, use, condition, mileage, other things factor into what the right number ends up being. But um, with that funding mechanism, we don't come close to one, let alone four pumper tankers and if there's an aerial truck conversation at some point. So there is a logistical challenge to that um, in the timing. And essentially, you'd be committing to fiscal 25, having some fire equipment reserve increase of probably at least seventy-five to a hundred thousand dollars before we've even looked at the rest of the budget. So then we probably have to make that up somewhere else or that gets passed on directly. So there's that's if we need nine trucks in the Randolph fleet. Yeah there are right. nine nine in service, yeah. We haven't sold the tenth, which is but it's not in service, is the old East Randolph one. It's just sitting there right now. And it, it could be close to uh, fiscal 26 before that truck actually got delivered too. Yeah, so we have to be able to make that transfer even on the current schedule right on July 1. We usually make them a little later in the year. Um, so it gets into just how you juggle it all out. And then if we do that, we're back almost a square one, a little bit behind where we are there, and that there's about $50,000 now in, in that reserve and other trucks in line. So it's just, 
solving the two different but connected math problems. Trevor and I also looked at, well, is there another truck in the fleet that you could just replace ours with, but the only ones that you would are just about as old as our truck. But somewhere we've got to, so we replace yours, and then Randolph Village is going to say, well, we want ours replaced, and if you look at the others in the fleet, they're just as old as ours, so we want ours to be new. Yeah. Like, somewhere that cycle's what's got to break, because yeah. we don't need nine fire trucks for the town of Randolph. That's excessive. And, you know, it's, where does that, where does that stop? Do we agree that we're going to eliminate, you know, two out of the fleet? to replace one, you know, is there, I think we've, we've somehow got to get to that, that piece, because at 400 to more than 400, like yours is 400, because you don't want all the extra seating capacity. The village wants all the extra seating capacity, which adds 100 to 120,000 to their truck. Um, so yeah. theirs are over a half a million. So, you know, at that dollar value, you know, and we've applied for grants for these, and we get told you got way too much equipment to begin with, so we get eliminated from the competition early. Like, but somewhere that's a hefty price per truck to think we're going to float one. Well, it's what one every other year if you're going to be in a cycle with that many trucks. Larry, did you told me that uh, custom cap pumpers like the village has you? Pretty hard to buy one for under eight hundred thousand right now. But now, if you look at the number we have, if the average is between fifteen and twenty years, we've got every two years we have to come up with between a half a million and eight hundred thousand to replace a truck. There's, there's the probably no reason why the pumpers can't go at least twenty years, maybe twenty five, and uh, you know tankers can probably go longer than that. Tim, what, what, I don't know anything about fire trucks. What, what is it about them that over time brings them to a point where you're like, we need to, re we need to replace this truck? Are there particular systems that start to fail? Is there like, what is it about the, the system of a truck that well, gets you to that point? Part of the problem is um, lots of times machinery, if you don't use it every day, it doesn't last as long as something you use every day. You know, it's not good for trucks to just sit around doing nothing. The, um, like I, we had one of the fire calls we had yesterday, the transmission was slipping on this truck that we want to replace. Hopefully it just needs filtering and uh, the oil changed in the transmission. It's like a garden hose. Let it hang out for any period of time. The gasket in it dries up. And then you go to put it on, it springs a leak. So if you think about a fire truck and all the different places, water goes through them, the pumps, the, the different pieces on them. You let it sit. You know, you're, you, I don't, I'm not sure what Randolph Center is. They all have their own schedule, but I can tell you Brookfields because I live it, but like one, one meeting is business one meeting's training, so once a month you might do something, but your training might not be with that truck. So if you don't have any calls, it could be two months before you run anything through it. So that all sits, then you fire it up and it's dry, it's you know, got whatever that, challenges. I guess my question really is though, obviously, you know, piece of equipment, any piece of equipment starts out new, it's great for a long time, don't need to do anything to it. At a certain point, things start to wear, they start to fail. Sometimes you replace them, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you decide you can live with the problem, sometimes you fix it, and sometimes you're like, this doesn't pay to fix. And different pieces of equipment go through that kind of a process in different kinds of ways. I know what it's like for like my cars, because I've replaced a bunch of cars over the years. I know what it's like to make those decisions around automobiles. Well, I can, guess my question is, how does that work when you're talking about a piece of equipment like a fire truck like how what what causes you to say at a certain moment okay it's time to replace this truck whereas two years ago we were, we were okay 
when two years from now, oh my gosh, we don't want to get there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So guess, the East Randolph one, it's because it had mechanical failure with the truck itself. So the truck itself would die going to the fire. That's you know that's an easy one, right? You you put mechanic work into it. I don't know how many times it went to Lucky's, and had a sizable bill, and then it would die on the next call. You're hearing Tim talking about the transmission is already slipping on that one. So sometimes you can take the body off the truck and put it on a new cabin chassis. You know, you go back years ago in the, what, 70s, 80s, it was the old highway truck. They'd take the old highway truck and they'd put the body on it and the fire department would run that around for a few years and then your highway truck would transition again and if your fire truck needed replacing, you got the hand-me-down from the, from the highway truck. And, you know, it wasn't good enough for the highway, but they'd put it on their fire truck and then pretty quick that would fail. So. Most times it's the actual truck itself that starts to fail before the equipment that's on it. But by the time you get ready to go, the equipment's getting old. Sometimes it's obsolete. You got NFPA standards on some stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear them talk about uh, their air packs and whatnot can only be 10 years, right? Turnout gear and air packs. The other piece of the puzzle is that uh, I'm not sure just what the figures are, but you get up over 20 years and it's hard to uh, to get a truck certified by NFPA standards. Mm -hmm. It's a combination. And there, you know, there's there more and more regulations. But what is the commitment that Dingy has voiced or estimated if he's going to commit to a price now, even though the truck won't come for two years, as you said, any specified number or an estimated yes, number? Four hundred thousand. That includes the, the cabin chassis. Pay. We huh? we're yeah. we're waiting on another price on cabin chassis. I don't know that it's going to be any lower. Just the cabin chassis itself is it's a freight liner. It's a hundred and seven thousand. We priced a Peterbilt through Lucky, and that was one hundred and twenty-two thousand. But there's a there's a Freightliner dealership right down in Lebanon. So as far as the cabin chassis goes, it would be pretty easy to get that service <coughs> too if we needed to. And. Um. To be the person that makes people share things, there's no conversations about, hey, can we have one of your pumper tankers, somebody else in Randolph? <laughs> <laughs> that does never go over well. I'm aware, <laughs> but I had to bring it up. <laughs> you know, when the, um, Like our pumper was getting worked on at one time, when the Randolph Village fire station burned down, our pumper was getting worked on. So one of their pumpers was up to our station. That's the only reason that one didn't burn up too. Hmm. You know, you could. <laughs> Every everybody wants to protect what they have. I mean, right. I have my ideas and the other chiefs had their ideas, and, uh -huh. you know. The answer is yes. <laughs> they could. They could. Whether you could ever the, come to an agreement? Well, you might have to, yeah. right? If your truck is no longer able to function, the town owns nine trucks. I think the answer is you have to figure out something. If, if it's pretty, according to all the things you've told me for a long time now, Trini, it seems pretty universally agreed upon that we have more equipment than we need. And so we need to figure out a way to share because at $400,000 a truck, or minimum, um, that's, that's a lot of money for equipment. If, because somebody even doesn't if, even want if to we share. really need it, it's a lot of money. <laughs> but if, if it's stuff that you can argue we, that, that yeah. this is sur really surplus, 
Um, that that seems, seems like we need to figure that out. But Randolph is is unique geographically from a lot of many other town that I know of. I mean, I live probably as far away from here as you can get and still live in the town of Randolph. It takes me a good 20 minutes to get here. I don't think that that's that weird. I mean, the town's all across Vermont are all yeah, kind of around the same size. and But you got two valleys and a, you know, a mountain in between, and we're covering right. Braintree, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Williamstown does too, though. I understand that and the geographical location. I'm just wondering if the surplus of equipment is preventing fluid funding from grant services that might allow for future funding to get these faster. So if you consolidate or, you know, sell or whatever is done it might open up those grant funds that you said we keep getting disqualified for so that you know one of these seriously hurting trucks can actually get replaced or you know two in a more timely manner you probably aren't going to qualify for a grant unless you could get the number of trucks down to like four okay six i'm not what's that six six yeah. six so. is the magic number and we're at nine And what do they base that six on? Is it the, the number of calls a year, the types of calls? I mean, it's all in that population, of geography. Yeah. yeah. When the when the village station burnt, we went to FEMA to try to get money out of their firefighter grant program, which will replace trucks. And that's when they told us that if we had six, they would. Put consider participating but we have nine we could just move them around share and we would be just fine so that's why I said it might be a case where we say let's get rid of two and we'll replace one you know if we took two of the older ones and got rid of it and replaced one truck to start us in the so we we're at least heading downward in number mm -hmm. Well, we're hardly alone in having hills and dales and valleys and mountains right. and, and sprawling, sprawling geography to, uh, to, well, to deal with. Williamstown's got the same hills, right? They go hmm. up through to Websterville and down in their village and up to the top and partway down headed towards Northfield. Mm -hmm. And when did they got three? Who's that? Williamstown. They got three trucks. Three trucks and an ambulance. I, I'm not okay. sure, but they're similar size but, communities. But even that, you yeah. know, their their main part is in one valley, and they go up both sides, and they don't really have anything past the, the top. Yeah, I think the the question is, does having something down on the other side, whichever side you want to call it equate to the need to have six more trucks and three separate fire stations and you know three fire stations with two trucks <clears throat> in each one to me seems like the right balance if you have a if you have a major call i believe the yeah, protocol yeah. is to call more than just one station yeah. anyway so yeah. you know at that point you've got at least four of the town's assets if you have two in each station possibly six possibly mutual aid, depending where it is coming in. You know, so I think you're... <clears throat> I've, I've talked to Trini some about this. If you still have three stations, you really need to have four trucks with pumps on them. Because if one pumper goes down, then that extra <clears throat> pumper can go to that station. That's your primary first response, getting water and a pump on the scene. So it's important to have one functioning at all stations if they're going to be the, the primary response. So that part does make sense. Then if your you, next one is water capacity. Yeah. And if you're going to get down to six trucks, you're probably going to have to get eliminate the ladder truck. 
But we have those in surrounding towns, right? Berlin's got one. Northfield's got one. Yeah, right. whether That's right. they're not. Like, Northfield and Williamstown, their tower isn't as big as ours. I'm not sure it could... Uh, I'm not sure it could reach some of the buildings we have. That's more than 800,000 to replace that. One... 1.3 million, last I heard. Yeah. <sighs> but the lot of trucks we bought um, have been used ones. You can buy, there are some cities, Burlington, they replace their ladder trucks every 10 years, I believe. And you can buy one of those for 40 to 50% of new. How hard are those used in Edmonton? The one we have now came from everything. Like I'm thinking of Montpelier rolls a fire truck with an ambulance because it's the same crew. I don't know if Burlington does. The one we have now came from South Burlington, I believe. It uh, it had to. It was sent up to Canada to be rebuilt. They had the ladder trucks have. They call it a torx torque box, which is a big box inside the whole body that holds the ladder, and they had to uh, build a new one for that. And I don't... VTC was in on... VTC purchased the first ladder truck, and the one we have now, <coughs> I'm not sure whether it was the town bought the, <coughs> bought the truck and VTC paid to have it refurbished or vice versa, one or the other. But you know how money is with Vermont State Colleges right now. <laughs> and leadership. Well, they give us a whole whopping $1,200 a year? I think so, yeah. They make it rain for you, right? It yeah. covers everything. <laughs> worth a discussion with the other chiefs on what does this look like and how do we get down to a realistic number and and a replacement plan. I'm gonna say do you want to see some modeling maybe different plans cost if we took a truck out of the village and moved it to Randolph Center to get us until FY twenty six when we would have the four hundred and 54,000 in the reserve fund. You know, what would that look like? Is that, is it, we get rid of the truck that's the problem for Randolph Center, we get a different truck moved up there, and then we have a new one built and it replaces the one that gets moved up there for them. It's kind of helping us <coughs> move that number down. Well, trying to think of ways that we kind a of get to of, a goal and yeah. still you know, get coverage. There's no reason our, our truck won't last another two years. Part of the problem with build, bringing a Randolph uh, village truck uh, up to our station is that none of their trucks are made so you can put chains on them. There's not enough clearance on the wheel wells to put chains on them. And... Uh, we have to go out on the interstate quite a bit, and you need chains on when it's icy. The interstate is probably the most dangerous thing we do. Well, it's ridiculous what takes place on that interstate. Yeah. Very much ridiculous. That's another one of those the state shifting responsibility down to the town. So, so a car car fires, uh, accidents, accidents, car fires, accidents. Yeah. Do we get paid for that? No, nope. we don't. No, and it's terrible because the cars do not slow down, and they could give two craps that you're a fireman standing there. Yeah, if you but we don't get paid. They for hit. That? So our son came around the corner of the front of the fire truck one day, and a car hit the flashlight hanging off the side of him. Yeah. Whoa. And they don't slow down. They don't stop. They just keep rolling. 
They you're don't sitting care. in the truck and you gotta keep one eye in your mirror. We've had instances where the guy sitting in the driver's seat had to put it in gear and move ahead quick because the car was about ready to plow into the back of him. <clears throat> it's awful. I just awful. don't get that we don't get compensated for that. That's we that's unconscionable. We don't even I get mean, priority can, in grants, we get nothing. You you can you can bill insurance companies. And we did, uh, we had uh, an incident where a pickup truck cut off a milk tanker truck. And the milk tanker piled into the guardrails and leaked diesel fuel everything, everywhere. I had um, three firemen got diesel fuel on their gear and that's once you get diesel fuel on it, you, there's no washing it, you throw it away. And we were out there for six hours and we build the pickups insurance company and I don't, what did we get Trina, you remember? 15, 16,000? Yeah, we built them, we built the batteries on North Randolph Road. The one that oh, went that. over the batteries went down into the brook. Oh yeah. And then we built the, um, the one by the pull off just south of the Randolph exit. Was that building supply, something? What was it? It went everywhere. Hmm. So we have gotten some compensation from. But it's your larger ones. You know, you you go out and it's a a normal accident, and you're basically providing traffic control. We haven't ever, we haven't done the tracking and build the insurance companies for that. It's the larger, <coughs> more of the a lot of the commercial, more commer where a commercial vehicle is impacted. Mm -hmm. That would go after. I mean, in that case, that was the pickup that caused the accident, so they got to pay the bill. But it was the commercial truck that caused all the the damage and the need for response. When you get into hazmat cleanup and whatnot, then you're into a lot of money because you got all the pads, and then you got to have them. You know, they got to take them away. They're hazmat. That's a hefty bill. Yeah. You had three sets Most of turnout of that, gear. That hazmat stuff doesn't cost the town anything because the state gives us all that those mats and everything and and like gas bills at rinkers they have barrels there that we put all that stuff in and they pay for getting rid of that. Didn't we have to do something we had to put the batteries into special tanks, didn't we? On the North Randolph thing and they sat around and that was a That was quite a yeah. Larry, is there a way to research when they respond if this if we're just missing something from the state that we can get? Some like if there's possible compensation from the state that we're missing. Yeah, there's none. We've been there. We've met with yeah. public safety. We've met with people every, on it. There isn't. I think every fire department that covers the interstate has tried to get money from the state. <laughs> I feel like one of Bolton and Richmond just tried it or had that conversation. Somebody went that way did. Okay. Without much luck. But. As far as charging people, I don't think it's right to charge a resident of Randolph. Right. Mm -hmm. Or any town we do mutual aid with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Because we, we all pay for the fire department through our property taxes. It's like our, it's like paying for an insurance policy. It's mm -hmm. really what it is, except yeah. you don't have a choice. You have to do it. <laughs> but I, I, did, yeah. uh, I did talk to Carol Bushy one time, and she told me it's becoming more common for fire departments to charge. I mean, I, have, I mean, this is just personal story, but our fire alarms went off when we lived in a different state, and we got billed because they had to come out and mm -hmm. go through the house and it was minor there was nothing wrong but we got a have pretty hefty bill for that whole truck from the fire out. department yep mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was for our house so the, the ones that you're out all the time because it malfunctions there should be a fee for yeah. you know if it goes off the way it's supposed to i can see it but you've got something yeah. after, after system. the second or third time we usually <laughs> threaten them and uh with a bell and then they'll get it fixed. <laughs> McDonald's is good for that. <laughs> There's a couple of them in Brookfield that are too. So you recommended meeting with the chiefs 
to figure stuff out. We got to look at put together some what is. They're all going to have to get on board. I, mean, I don't. I don't see us able to have a replacement cycle for nine vehicles. Doesn't as, seem reasonable. Doesn't as the seem. price goes up, it, it's worse, and and I think we'd have a hard time justifying keeping nine in the fleet. But you know, if we look at what does that look like? Here's the vehicles we have now. What does the replacement look like to get us down to a reasonable number? Give the fire group a, a task to do. Yeah. <coughs> you know, my perspective too is you can't have the majority of the equipment in one corner of the town either. No, that's why I think you got to go like two, two, and two. The big calls, you're all there's going to be more than one of you called out where, where you need the extra fleet. Tough one. All right. So, good math will work. Yeah, come up with a few models and then. Uh, I'll join you even to sit down with the chiefs and have some type of a conversation about Glenn what does this look like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's a tough conversation, but we gotta have it. We can't afford it. Well, it would be nice yes. if we could get a representative from the select board to come to the fire commission meeting, but that hasn't happened in a long time. No, it happened when we had two of the members on the board. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mike, Mike. Mike and Matt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of those optional committees. It's not the way it's set up. It's, it doesn't require a liaison, but. No, yeah. It sounds one. like in this instance it might. And this one it does. Who yeah. must? In the last no. uh, couple of years, we might meet every other month. Just to say you did. <laughs> I've gone before. They've been very nice to me so far. So. <laughs> <laughs> did you bring snacks with you? Is that the end? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. I'll bring snacks next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll get Trevor to run a few models, and then we'll sit down with. Okay. Everybody, and when does that commission meet? Uh, second Tuesday. Maybe in June. 7 o'clock at the Village Firehouse. Just do those first two full weeks of June. I wouldn't be able to do it in person. My wife's out of town for those for training. The third week when I ship the kids out to their grandparents. Or the week before that. I'm totally <laughs> okay. You know, if you want to meet some off uh, Monday night, you might be able to get the three. Chiefs together. Yeah, East Randolph meets every Monday, don't they? Yeah, I mean, but we have. can get away. We have somebody at somebody goes to firehouse every Monday night. We have a meeting on the second Monday and training on the fourth Monday. Okay. okay. So if we can get something going for June, so we don't delay it very long. Okay. Come up with something. Okay. I think um, actually there's five Mondays this month. That's what everybody needs is five Mondays. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, we'll get something. It's four two. We'll get something for sure. <laughs> Thank you. If, if, you want, if you schedule a meeting with the fire chiefs for some time in June, let me know when. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in going. Uh, uh, outdoor seating requests for sweet scoops. Um, I'm planning to recuse yeah, myself as yeah, a member of yeah. the building manager for that building. Um, and have my studio there, business inside that building. This looks to me like the same as what we approved last year, just no umbrellas. Pretty okay. similar. I didn't get any complaints That's last year, except for the umbrella. Yeah. The year before, I guess it was the umbrellas, right? Was there a software seating last year? Mm -hmm. 
Did we get the certificate of insurance? After you if you if presuming you approve, <coughs> we would then you know, make it contingent before the seed cloud get that. Got it. That's ready to be done. Happens pretty fast. A motion to approve the outdoor seating for 15 North Main Group Sweet Scoops. I will second. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And the insurance certificate. Motion carries authorizing an RFP for the North Wells and Reservoir yes. interim sure. project funding. Right. We've got a contract yeah. signing scheduled for tomorrow afternoon. Um, we got confirmation the other day of, that our congressional earmark has moved through the right channels and it's moving into its deliverable phase. So that'll come to us through so, STAG grant, I think it is, a state tribal assistance grant, so it's EPA money that flows to us that way. So our funding's all lining up well. Um, but one of the things that we're gonna need, it's about a 240 day window from contract signing 270 to substantial completion if everything goes well, if there are any other changes. If that happens with this project, those will be the first times that we, we don't encounter weirdness, but we'll take it. Um, but I think project funding, because we got, when we refer to it as the Frankenstein's monster, just because there are four distinct funding sources, they're all gonna, there'll be similar requirements, but they're all gonna be a little bit different. They're all gonna be reimbursement based, so there's an, SRF loan is the sort of the biggest single piece at a million and a half. Voters approved that, 17, 18 time frame, I think it was. And then we've got Northern Borders Grant, a state CDBG grant, and now this congressional earmark um, making up the rest of that substantial funding right there. So because they're reimbursement based, we're gonna have to pay for some of these things up front. And then there might be a period of jockeying for reimbursement based on prior experience, that seems to, your first request is a lower percentage of what you put in, and then you fight over the rest and keep fighting until you get it all, but, um, so we'll need some funding to keep going. So we'll look to borrow, since it's probably gonna be a bond anticipation only, I, mean, I don't know what they call it, but that's essentially what it'll be, maybe against the SRF loan, and that'll keep us liquid throughout the project. That's essentially one half of the project cost is, is equal to our largest funding commitment and we can get that going pretty quick. We'll run it like we've run tax anticipation note processes before. We've got nine lenders in a list that we'll email it to and we'll make it available for an open bid. They'll, based on the nine we've got, it's unlikely that there's somebody out there. Other than that, it's mostly all of the banks you can think of kind of thing um, that operate in our region or near enough by. And then we'd look to have that lined up by June 1st if we're contract signing won't be mobilizing much before then, but it won't be too long after that either. Are we good with the rates currently charged in the water district to cover this loan and anything else that we've got to pay for with bringing these online? I think we're going to, part of this process, some of the things we may want to do as we get a little closer to mid to end of summer, and we can sort of track where the project's hopefully going to land take a look at those rates, take a look at what the debt service will be on the remaining one and a half, and figure out we are due for rate changes on both the water and wastewater sides, because we haven't touched them in a while. Um, so they've been sufficient to fund operations, so there are any concerns there, but at the same time, if we add more long-term cost without any coming off. Yeah. Um, what's the status of the uh, late fees going back onto the water and wastewater bills? They at the meeting we had for water abatement, they haven't been done in eight months. Yeah, I, with staffing, we're able to start to process those now. That was from last spring through into the fall in particular. That was, there wasn't anybody to actually assess them. So or Anybody are, that did, I should say. So are those just gonna be a wash and forgiven or are townsfolk going to get retroactively late feed? No, I, I think at that point, because it was our capacity issue, Okay. I mean, that would have been one of the ideas was that we hadn't been able to do it to suddenly have a bill show up. At the same time, what we're going to have to do is engage some folks who have been, most of the customers on that list are chronic. Right. Not 
first time, <laughs> on a first time attendee kind of thing. And so we'll have to also dig in with some of those. Because one of the tools that we'll probably revive at some point over the summer is the tax sale process, mm -hmm. which we've used for late water and sewer payments, but primarily for dealing with taxes. Mm -hmm. We were very almost militant about its use for a little while. And then just as staffing allowed, or didn't allow, we hadn't done it, mm -hmm. provided some extra grace. We haven't seen huge spikes in delinquency, but we're at the point where with the chronic ones, it's time to show the stick part of, mm -hmm. of the program. Okay. Can entertain a motion to authorize the RFP? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Now for the manager's report. We went out and just to add on for the paving RFP, we went out and took a look. John Changra, the highway superintendent today. Um, a variety of different roads with all kinds and types and shapes and sizes, but um, looking to make sure that the paving candidates that we've talked about make the most sense. East Bethel Road's been the primary. That's what we went and got the applied for the class two grant for. We haven't heard back on that. The idea would be that we would do all of that. It was in last year's list, but got moved out because of some of the cost. If we don't get the grant, we were talking about how to split it essentially in half and do some repair work and which half to do first um, so that we can still do some of it. And then which candidates should be added with it. Um, Hard race is one that's got some interesting spots and it has it's been a long time since it's seen there's some water runoff and some other issues so that was one that came up and then to try to maybe grab the remaining section of Thayer Brook um, that we haven't gotten yet and then if we can even squeeze it in um, maybe a section on Beanville Road um, figuring out which way we want to work from there and if not Beanville Road in particular would roll over into fiscal 25 um, and we'd start to build around that as well so we're still working towards that, trying to get those out a little bit earlier. If we can get those out around Memorial Day, we'll be a little bit earlier than last year, um, which hopefully puts us in the queue to have the work done earlier. Last year, there were was a bit of an aberration though in terms of how that all shook out everything from weather to contractor availability to scheduling to quality of work. That was an odd one. Um, and the year before was the opposite. It went fairly smoothly and quietly. So hopefully we, we can get back to that program. And then nothing to add from the stuff that's in there. We're going to look to buy a truck for buildings and grounds that was in the capital program. Be a similar truck to the one that we bought for highway. Um, so at some point we may ask you in the in-between um, if you're okay with that with a ratification in June type of thing. Um, so that's in the mix. I don't think if there's anything else beyond that. So many different things happening, I have a hard time picking one out. <laughs> All right, entertain a two part motion to go into executive session. The first motion is to find that executive session is both prudent and necessary. <clears throat> I move that we find executive session is. Can I do both? They should be separate as well. Okay. We've been advised. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, I move that we go into executive session um, pursuant to 1 BSA 313 uh, to discuss the appointment and evaluation of a public official. Well, first, you have to do the one, the finding, and then you can combine the two reasons into one motion. I think I misunderstood your question. So, your first motion would be to find that executive session is both necessary and prudent. Uh, right. Your second motion is to go into executive session with the two citations. Oh, we can bundle them yep, there. Those can okay. be bundled. Sorry. I, I move that um, it's necessary and prudent to go into executive session. Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Motion series. Else, <laughs> okay. Uh, I have right here. Consider a motion. I move to consider a motion to enter executive session pursuant to one BSA. What's that little thing mean? Um, three section. Thir section, thank you. 313A, 1E, pending litigation legal, and 1 BSA, section 113A, 3, appointment evaluation of public official. I second. 